On this Friday night, the intensifying pressure to save Afghans from the Taliban. The push for Canada to do more and act faster. Washington's confidence in its evacuation plan as those who helped us wait. They will kill me. A pledge for paid sick leave, what the Liberals are promising and why the NDP isn't buying it. In Israel, a high COVID vaccination rate and now one of the world's highest infection rates. The remedy and the warning to Canada. And a story we all need right now. That's beyond my wildest dreams. A boy, a basketball and the neighbors giving him a shot at a great future. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. As Canada's political parties campaign for your votes, we are going to start in Afghanistan with the thousands of people who have heard the promise Canada will take them in, but fear they'll be left behind to be hunted down by the Taliban. This is the legacy of the end of America's longest war. Stun grenades fired to try and hold back the crush of people who still crowd the perimeter of Kabul airport. Babies and children lifted over the razor wire to save them from being crushed and trampled. The U.S. Marine Corps posted these photos from inside the airport compound. Soldiers cradling babies. NATO says more than 18,000 people have been flown out of the city since the Taliban took over the capital five days ago. Many of them are foreign diplomats, their families and citizens of other countries. They are given first priority. Thousands of those who risk their lives working for Western countries still wait. We're told a Canadian military evacuation flight did leave Kabul last night. Defence officials say 175 vulnerable Afghans and 13 foreign nationals were on board. And they say 1,000 Afghan nationals at risk of retribution for their work with Canada and other allied countries have been flown out so far. There is intense pressure to do more and act faster. This open letter from the Canadian Association for Refugee and Forced Migration Studies calls on all the federal party leaders to expedite the resettlement process for 20,000 Afghans and to evacuate those Afghans and their families who urgently require protection. We have been working closely uh, with our allies, particularly with uh, the U.S. and the U.K., uh, on ensuring that we are uh, as effective as possible all together on bringing out as many Afghans as possible and getting people to safety uh, given the very difficult crisis right now. The Taliban controls the routes to the airport in Kabul. There are reports today the U.S. military used helicopters to ferry 96 Afghans over those Taliban checkpoints to the airport. There is no word whether Canada is planning to do the same. Abigail Beeman has the latest on Canada's actions in Afghanistan. Abigail? Donna, the Liberal government has been heavily criticized on the campaign trail for not doing enough to get more people out of Afghanistan faster and even for the timing of calling an election in the first place given the number of people whose lives are at risk. The airport is flooded with people trying to escape. Friday, Justin Trudeau was on the defense once again saying he's briefed daily on the evolving situation, but he wouldn't clearly answer whether special forces are going outside the airport to help find people in Kabul who are at risk and help get them onto flights, as some of our allies are doing. I'm not going to comment on operational matters uh, for reasons of security, but I will say uh, that our uh, our uh, forces uh, and our uh, our uh, our partners uh, are doing absolutely everything necessary to get as many people out as quickly as possible. Conservatives are criticizing the Liberals for not doing enough fast enough when the Taliban's rise didn't exactly happen overnight. We asked Aaron O'Toole today whether he would insist people have proper documentation. That and general communication from the government to people on the ground trying to get out has been a big issue. We've been asking for five years to bring back interpreters, contractors that are at risk because they helped Canada. So let's get them out of that risk as soon as possible and sort out the, the, the paperwork later. There are also questions around how many people Canada is willing to put on each evacuation flight, who's allowed on those flights and when they will depart. Donna? All right, Abigail Beeman in Winnipeg tonight. Thank you. American President Joe Biden said today his administration is focused on getting Americans out of Afghanistan by August 31st. He says he is also committed to trying to evacuate as many Afghan interpreters and others who assisted the U.S. government, a goal that Biden said was equally important, almost. 
stay past the 31st to make that happen, to bring all the Americans out, to bring those SIVs out? I think we can get it done by then, but we're going to make that judgment as we go. In the meantime, the Taliban is consolidating power. It has placed security for the Afghan capital in the hands of senior members of the Haqqani network, which has close ties with foreign jihadist groups, including a long-standing association with al-Qaeda. Jackson Prosco looks at what is unfolding in Afghanistan. Outside the Kabul airport, civilians beg for a chance at freedom, passing infants across barbed wire. The growing crowd, at times pushed back by Afghan soldiers who fire into the air. I'm getting to the airport. That chaos extends to the tarmac where thousands spent the day stuck in the hot sun. Flights were suspended for hours because of deteriorating conditions in Qatar. The facility where evacuees were being taken reached capacity. Resources were overwhelmed. There'll be plenty of time to criticize and second guess when this operation is over. But now, now, I'm focused on getting this job done. U.S. President Joe Biden acknowledged the difficulties, but vowed safe exit for Americans, allies, and the Afghans who helped them. He insisted the Taliban is cooperating and allowing safe passage to the airport. To the best of our knowledge, the Taliban checkpoints, they are letting through people showing American passports. Those on the ground tell a different story. Afghan interpreter Omid Mahmoudi worked with U.S. forces and fears for his life if he can't escape. They will kill me and they will behead me. As a foreigner, um, I mean, I'm nervous. I'm absolutely nervous because we can't trust the Taliban. Yet Australian filmmaker Jordan Bryan has no plans to leave Kabul. Documenting the women who bravely celebrated Afghan Independence Day in defiance of the Taliban fearing the situation will only deteriorate in the weeks to come. They've just waltzed on in and taken over and it just, it just can't be this easy. Like there has to be really dark days to come. Already, U.S. troops have gone over the wall at the airport to rescue dozens of American citizens. Other nations have brought in helicopters to airlift their citizens to safety. The forces that invaded and occupied Afghanistan for more than two decades are in a hasty retreat, knowing the chaos of today may pale in comparison to the turmoil that could come. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. Many Canadians are watching the situation in Afghanistan closely, and at the same time, the pandemic has not ended. More than 64% of Canadians are now double vaccinated, but COVID-19 cases are now soaring in parts of Canada. The fourth wave, which public health officials have been warning about for months, has taken hold. The highly transmissible Delta variant is driving the surge. There are more than 22,000 active cases in Canada now. 753 people are in the hospital, up just slightly from yesterday. And it is in the West that the highest rate of active cases per 100,000 people exists. The Northwest Territories has seen the sharpest rise in infections. There are now at least 169 active cases there. Last week, there was only one. An outbreak has been declared at a long-term care home. Two communities have public health emergencies in effect and are pleading for government help. This week marks the first time the Delta variant has been detected in the Northwest Territories. One measure the federal government brought in during the pandemic could be permanent if the Liberals are re-elected. Leader Justin Trudeau made that promise today, ripping a page from the NDP. Our chief political correspondent David Aiken is traveling with the Liberal campaign. David? Well, Donna, Liberal leader Justin Trudeau promised today that if re-elected, he will make 10 days of paid sick leave available to federally regulated workers. And that would make permanent what had been a temporary measure brought in during the pandemic. As a government and as this country's largest employer, it's up to us to set the example. Trudeau also promised to negotiate with the provinces to extend paid sick leave to all sectors. The NDP immediately pounced on this promise, saying they proposed precisely this measure 18 months ago, and the Trudeau government never acted on it. The Liberals are also promising to make an extra $100 million available to schools to improve air ventilation systems. Public health officials say that's one key way to limit the spread of the airborne virus. Our kids have to be safe in our classrooms. That's non-negotiable. And their teachers and school staff 
well, they have to be safe too. Finally, Trudeau was asked about the U.S. decision to keep its land border closed to non-essential Canadian travelers for another 30 days until at least September 21st. We will work together as much as possible to coordinate and make sure things are going well, but every country gets to make its own decisions about how to best keep, Canada, keep their citizens safe. Trudeau and his election team will have an off day Saturday and be back on the election trail Sunday. Donna? All right, David Aiken in Winnipeg, thanks. The federal NDP leader stopped in Saskatchewan today and was overcome with emotion at one point. Jagmeet Singh visited the site where 751 unmarked graves were discovered at the site of a former residential school. Mike LeCouture is following the NDP campaign. A solemn walk through the unmarked graves of the residential school of Cowessis First Nation. Jagmeet Singh, his wife, and the First Nation's chief, Cadmus Delorme, used the moment to underscore the work still needed on reconciliation. I commit to this. With everything I can, with every ounce of, of strength I have, I will fight for justice for Indigenous people. The NDP leader says past governments haven't done nearly enough, a refrain opposition parties have repeated for decades, something not lost on Chief Delorme. You know, I encourage Government of Canada um, to, to, to work more quicker and provide uh, the strength for Indigenous nations to come up with the solutions. Now, all parties have committed to walk the road to reconciliation with Indigenous communities during this election campaign. Advocates say they want more than just promises. They want systemic change. I think that uh, the way that the system is set up makes us look like beggars and squatters in our own country. And that's not the way it should be. The last Liberal budget did commit $18 billion over five years to help improve the quality of life in Indigenous communities. Trudeau acknowledges more must be done. I think that everyone shares their impatience, my impatience, to get even more done even faster on reconciliation. But what took generations and in some cases even centuries to break will take more than a few years to fix. Indigenous leaders from Manitoba agree it can't happen overnight, but they say the discovery of mass graves near the sites of former residential schools prove we are still at the start of the process. But we have to get to the truth. Without truth, there is no reconciliation. And looking at that truth in Canada, Canadians have to see what that truth is before there can be any reconciliation. Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole echoed that sentiment, adding all Canadians want to see action on reconciliation after a summer that saw so much pain in Indigenous communities. Michael Couture, Global News, Cowessis First Nation, Saskatchewan. Getting as many people back to work is key for Canada's road to economic recovery. And today on the campaign trail, Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole unveiled a plan to create jobs, promising to cover between 25 and 50 percent of salaries for new hires for six months if he's elected. 50 percent will be for people that have been unemployed for more than 10 months. We need to work with employers to hire those people to give all Canadians a chance. The Conservative leader says his Canada job surge plan will apply to all business sectors and will replace the Liberals' Canada emergency wage subsidy, which ends in October. Israel tackles a new COVID spike. Coming up, what it could signal to the rest of the world. Israel set the pace for vaccinations early in this pandemic, quickly administering doses to most adults. But now Israel is facing a worrying fourth wave, and the rest of the world is watching. It's not that vaccines don't work. They do. But their effect could diminish over time and in the face of the more contagious variants. Redmond Shannon explains. This is how Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett wants to tackle the fourth wave of COVID-19 in Israel booster shots rather than another lockdown. He and other 40-somethings became eligible for third doses Friday. We from Israel are going to share all the data, all the information, all the insights. The absence of a full lockdown this time has likely contributed to the sharp rise in infections, but so too has the apparent waning effectiveness of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine against the Delta variant. Just 39% according to Israeli figures last month. Newer numbers say that jumps to 86% for people over 60 who've had a booster. The third booster shot is important 
to overcome the uh, w waning immunity that we see among the elderly who have received their shots over five months ago. Given Israel's early speed of rolling out initial doses, that waning immunity is a warning sign to countries like Canada, especially as the colder months approach. Boosting is logical. It should be implemented. It's Immunologist Jonathan Gershoni says waning effectiveness is to be expected. What's encouraging is that two doses remain highly effective against serious cases of COVID-19. Deaths in Israel appear to be lower than in the previous wave. How is the vaccine meeting the challenge of so many repeats in attempts to infect? It's, it's a numbers game, but I don't think that we should be overly concerned. This week, the World Health Organization again criticized plans for booster doses, saying there's not enough scientific evidence to prove they're needed. High-income countries have already, on average, administered more than 103 doses per 100 people, whereas in Africa, that number stands at six. Ontario announced this week it's giving boosters to the most vulnerable. Germany and the United States plan rollouts in September. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Still ahead for undecided voters, one thing is clear, federal parties can't afford to ignore money matters. And now, here is the executive producer of Jeopardy, Mike Richards. His starring role lasted just nine days. Mike Richards has stepped down as the new host of Jeopardy. Clips have resurfaced featuring him making disparaging comments about women and other marginalized groups on a podcast. Richards was picked after a search that included trial runs with sports figures and celebrities. He says he had no say in his own selection, but that moving forward as host is not the right move for the show. He is reportedly staying on as executive producer, and the search will resume for another host. Well, as we approach September, Canadians have a lot on their minds. The federal election is a big one for many, with affordability and the rising cost of living among the top issues. Tonight, Anne Gaviola looks at the impact on Canadians and what people say they want federal leaders to do about it. Monique Gordon was laid off from her job as a security guard during the pandemic, a job she'd had for 17 years. Two key issues for her in this election, housing, specifically for renters like her, and affordable, accessible childcare. If I'm going to get a daycare, easily accessible, like close by so I could work any shift without having to be modified, that would be super great. She's undecided but leaning towards one party. I would say um, Jagmeet Singh. Why? Because... He challenges Justin Trudeau. According to the latest Ipsos polling, the Conservatives have emerged as the number one choice among respondents when it comes to the economy ahead of the Liberals, while the NDP take the top spot on matters of affordability and the cost of living. Between unprecedented government spending, a jaw-dropping federal deficit estimated at more than $354 billion this fiscal year, and inflation at levels we haven't seen in more than a decade, political observers say that on money matters, liberals are in the hot seat. They've got a record. They've got six years that they have to account for, so it makes them uh, particularly vulnerable. The pandemic has disproportionately hammered young workers. We've been through a global recession. We've graduated when there weren't many jobs and we've been rebuilding ever since. And then we dealt with a global pandemic. Millennials and Gen Z now make up the biggest cohort of eligible voters. So I think affordability anxiety when it comes to millennials is really our fear around not having enough dollars to stretch between homeownership costs, paying off student loan debt, caring for aging parents, and as well as their own retirement savings needs. The party that can convince voters it will make life more affordable may be rewarded when it's time to cast ballots. Anne Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. Next, a small gesture catches the eye of a big NBA star. If you shoot hoops in your driveway or backyard, you've probably fantasized about making a slam dunk that sends the crowds wild. Well, one Edmonton teenager could do nothing but dribble on his driveway. He didn't have a hoop until a neighbor decided to step in. And as Sarah Comedina reports, that kind gesture snowballed into something no one ever expected. Outside of his North Edmonton home, Anthony Mobike can be seen dribbling every day, sometimes hours at a time. I'm just dribbling my driveway. 
That's all the 14-year-old did because he didn't have a net to shoot at, and the neighbors noticed. I come outside and then I see like a man I barely ever see, like ever. So like, and then he's just like, hey, you like playing basketball? I'm like, yes. That man is Ian Ray. He lives across the street. I know he could dribble the ball. I haven't seen him shoot the ball yet. I thought whenever I dribbled, it made a racket and people would want to sleep or something like that. The noise didn't bother his neighbors. Instead, they wanted to nurture his talent. Ian made a Facebook post looking for help to get him a hoop. Your mom said he wanted to be a basketball player. Well, come here. You probably need a nut. Canadian Tire stepped in with a new hoop and basketball. Donations already collected went towards a $750 sport check gift card. I'll be in the NBA. 2026, I'll be there and then try and give back to those people and I will make them all proud. Anthony is already making an impression. His story has already been viewed more than a million times online. A recruiter at a private Toronto school has reached out with an offer to take part in a basketball program next year. It brought his mom to tears. My heart is full of joy. I'm overwhelmed. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to, like, all I can say is thank you so much. Perhaps the most surreal moment, a shout out from Anthony's idol, NBA superstar LeBron James, who posted on Instagram, Anthony, keep working, kid. You have another fan in me. LeBron's my inspiration. That's him right there. That's the main, LeBron's the main reason why I started playing basketball. Now he has the hoop to fulfill his dreams, all thanks to the generosity of his community. Sarah Comedina, Global News, Edmonton. And that's Global National for this Friday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is Belle Island in Conception Bay, Newfoundland and Labrador. We'd love to see Your Canada. Please email it to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Jeff Semple will be at the Anchor Desk over the weekend and I will see you again on Monday. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.